the decrease in smoking among kids is the rate of decrease is at an all time high while vaping has become so popular. Public health organizations that have been pushing so hard for bans on flavors in e-cigarettes or in some instances ban on the sale of e-cigarettes, higher taxes on e-cigarettes. Uh, this is all going to create a return to smoking for a significant number of adults. Hi, I'm Brett Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. As we head into the final few weeks of 2021, the future for vaping and other safer nicotine products has never looked so clear. Uncertainty and dread remain the dominant drivers heading into 2022. Both the United States and Canada face industry killing regulation with FDA's denial of millions of PMTA applications and Health Canada's proposed national flavor ban. New vape taxes threaten to choke vapors in North America and in regions across Europe. China's state tobacco monopoly administration just pulled e-cigarettes under its regulatory purview, which is worrying. And even the UK is facing calls for tough new controls on safer nicotine products. Prospects do look bleak, yet in a remarkable development, 2021 also witnessed a strong pushback in favor of tobacco harm reduction by a group of influential tobacco control experts, which could be a game changer. Joining us today on RegWatch is Dr. Kenneth Warner, Dean Emeritus and Professor Emeritus of Public Health at the University of Michigan. Dr. Warner, thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you for having me. So Dr. Warner, before we dive into the issues, please provide our viewers some insight into the scope of your career and in research in tobacco control, and please do not be humble. <laughs> How much time have you got? <laughs> we got the whole hour. I started uh, working on tobacco policy research in the mid 1970s. And from the point of my very first article uh, on the subject published in the American Journal of Public Health in 1977, uh, it has been an endlessly fascinating career. Uh, that first article led to a call, a personal call from the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, letters from the executive vice president of the Tobacco Institute, the lobby for the industry in those days in Washington. And shortly thereafter, Senator Jesse Helms, who was the uh, preeminent Mr. Tobacco in the U.S. Congress, uh, wrote to the agency that was funding me, the federal government agency funding my research, and insisted that they cut off my research funding, something that had never happened before. And things like that just have sort of persisted throughout my career and have made it very interesting to be very frank about it. Uh, I've had a number of opportunities that have made for uh, a fascinating involvement with government and with the private sector. Uh, a couple of examples, I was uh, asked by Dr. Koop, who was then the Surgeon General, to be the senior scientific editor on the 25th anniversary Surgeon General's report. Uh, I was the World Bank's representative to negotiations on what became the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which was WHO's very first global health treaty. Um, I was the very on the very first board of directors of the American Legacy Foundation, which is now the Truth Initiative. I served as president of the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. And currently I am on the Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee of FDA. So I've been involved in tobacco policy discussions and research all over the world, uh, certainly with a focus in the United States, but uh, in dozens of countries. And uh, as I say now, for about 45 years or so. That's amazing. And so, I mean, quite frankly, you're, you, you're at the pinnacle there of tobacco control. For our viewers that are not familiar with your writing and, and your research and position, what is your, that position when it comes to vaping? Well, when it comes to vaping, I believe that it can serve to reduce the harms associated with tobacco use and specifically with cigarette smoking. Um, I have done a lot of research in this area along with many of my colleagues, and uh, there's substantial evidence that vaping can and does reduce smoking. Currently, and this is the major concern I think most of us have, the focus certainly in the United States and in many countries around the world is exclusively on the fear that vaping is doing significant damage to kids uh, for a variety of reasons. The notion that it's addicting 
lots of kids, which gets greatly exaggerated. The idea that is causing kids to move on from vaping to smoking who otherwise would not have done so. And again, there's plenty of evidence that, uh, there, there's evidence on both sides of that issue, but there's a lot of evidence that uh, I have focused on that says it's probably not in fact happening. And the strongest evidence we have is that while vaping uh, has been in its ascendancy in the US for the last, oh, say six, seven years, we're seeing the most rapid rate of decline in cigarette smoking we have ever seen in the history of the US among kids. Now, vaping was actually causing smoking to be renormalized, as some suggest. One would expect to see an increase in smoking. We're seeing the exact opposite. But again, the country, the public health community, seems to be oblivious to this. They are just focusing on their fears about kids. And that's understandable. Kids are very compelling. And we don't want them using any nicotine products, ideally. But it's going to be hard to stop them from using any, as we know, with regard to marijuana and alcohol and any number of other behaviors. So when we had you last on, which was in early March of 2020, and boy, has a lot happened since then, you were at that time talking about the turbulence uh, that goes on with inside public health. And so I would guess it's fair to say, and we, you know, this has come out in our coverage, that there really is a divide within public health on this issue. Yeah, there's an enormous divide. I, I've never seen anything like it in my 45 years. Uh, I guess I describe it this way. In the US at least, the mainstream of public health, which consists of governmental agencies, uh, public health workers, and certainly the voluntary agencies, some of which are general organizations like American Cancer, American Heart, American Lung Associations, others of which are specific to tobacco, like the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and the Truth Initiative. They are all singularly focused on risk to kids and basically downplaying the potential of vaping to help adults. They wanna see very strict regulation of e-cigarettes so they can keep them out of the hands and mouths of kids. On the other side are a number of people like myself academics. Obviously, there's the vaping community as well. But I've often thought it would be interesting, and nobody's done this yet, to poll the scientists who have spent a lot of time working on the vaping issue to see where they stood as a group. I'm sure there would be a division, but I think it would be much closer uh, to even than what you see in mainstream public health. You know, over the course of the last year, uh, Dr. Warner, we've had a lot of, of your colleagues that have been on. We had Dr. Mermelstein, we've had Cliff Douglas on, Dr. Niera has been back on the show, all hammering home uh, along the same lines, these issues, so much so that um, Cliff Douglas actually, he had come out publicly and called for a ceasefire because of this divide. Could you provide some extra understanding around that? Well, a lot of people on our side of the issue wanting to see a balance between worrying about kids and worrying about adult smokers, uh, a lot of us have called for discussions, uh, sort of a, a summit, if you will, where we could get the two sides together, representatives of the various organizations, representatives of the various views, to try to sit down and have a civil conversation about the issues uh, to try to understand the science and to try to understand the policy implications. Uh, that's what Cliff Douglas was calling for. Uh, he is a particular, particularly articulate spokesman for that position, uh, and it has not happened. Frankly, I don't think that uh, the mainstream of public health has any interest in doing that. You came out uh, with a paper which was put out by the 15 past presidents for the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. Is that correct? Yes. And you, of course, being one of those 15, tell us about this paper. How big of a deal is this uh, for tobacco harm reduction? Well, th this paper was, it began as kind of an experiment. Uh, I wanted to write a piece that was going to discuss the need for balance between the issues facing kids and the issues facing adult smokers. And I, I was just curious whether I could get a number of my fellow past presidents of the Society for Research on Nicotine Tobacco 
which is an international scientific society, the major one in the tobacco field. I was curious if I could get several of them to join me in co-authoring the paper. So I contacted uh, five of them whom I felt pretty confident would be willing to join me and they were all happy to do it. And we agreed that it would be interesting to ask the other past presidents. Now at the time there were 26 past presidents. Uh, one of them we never could locate. We don't know what has happened to him. Uh, three of them declined to participate because they had what they believed would be viewed as conflicts of interest. Seven of them said that they did not wish to participate and 15 agreed to sign on, including the original five plus me. That means that out of 22, what you might call eligible past presidents, two thirds of them signed on to co-author the paper. Now keep in mind again that this is a very prestigious scientific society in the field of tobacco and nicotine. And two thirds of the presidents of that society felt that this was the right message, this notion that we need to balance our concerns about kids and about adult smokers. So we published it and um, we hope that it has had some influence and we certainly hope it continues to have some influence. Yeah, it's been characterized as an exceedingly rare kind of statement and public position to be taking. Yeah, I think that's probably a fair statement. Uh, I, I wanna emphasize here, as we did in the paper, this was not a position of the society. SRNT has taken no position on these issues and was not involved in the development of the paper or anything like it. It is simply a function of the 15 individuals who were the co-authors. So with inside the paper, and I'm going to be showing uh, some of that up on the screen as we're talking, I think it's worth uh, jumping into some of the, the positions. And well, it's almost like it was a paper that was clarifying the science on key issues that are impacting vaping. Well, that was the intent. I mean, the intent was to look at the science as objectively as we could and to present both sides where there in fact are two sides. Uh, I can tell you from the reaction that we've received from uh, what I again refer to as the mainstream of public health and, and from some very well-respected scientists, they feel we were not balanced, but uh, I think it is hard to imagine 15 past presidents of SRNT not presenting a balanced view, but uh, this is just where this field is these days. That paper, you were not balanced. Well, that was, that was some individual. That was only some people. Uh, it was a handful of scientists that we've heard from, two of whom wrote one of the commentaries that accompanied the piece in set, the September issue of the American Journal of Public Health. Uh, there was one very favorable commentary and one negative one. Uh, and uh, we've got two letters to the editor that will be published in the January issue of AJPH, will probably be out online in the near future, uh, and we have responded to them. So those, those are all from scientists in the field, uh, but uh, I, we haven't heard from a whole lot of the science community, uh, and we have, frankly haven't heard a whole lot from the, uh, the mainstream of public health. They, they were singularly silent on it in several instances. Uh, for example, I was saying all along that my, my favorite example of how this may have hit home was the fact that there was no commentary whatsoever coming from the campaign for tobacco-free kids, which is the heart of the anti-vaping uh, organizations. They said nothing about it. They have very recently come out with a very detailed statement uh, trying to respond to each of the points that we made uh, in a manner that's consistent with their view of the issue. Uh, but the fact that it took them that long to do it said to me that uh, this may have struck uh, hard in, in the hearts of some of the people who were not on the side of balance. The Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids is their response. There was also a recent response from Truth Initiative about harm reduction in general, tobacco harm reduction in general basically going after the entire theory as it's applied by those in the industry that are on side of uh, tobacco harm reduction. Are you familiar with that um, argument that Truth Initiative made? I'm, I'm only somewhat familiar with it. I am aware of it. Uh, I, I would say this, there are sort of two distinct pieces to the tobacco harm reduction promotion. 
Uh, one of them is industry based and the other is from the scientific community. I'm doing it from the perspective of a member of a scientific community, not the industry. I have a great deal of skepticism about the major cigarette companies. I always have. It is justified. And uh, I, I hear them talking about wanting a smoke-free world, but I don't see them moving very much in that direction. And in fact, I see them taking steps that are contrary to it, despite what they say. So I want to make it very clear, I have no association with the industry. I don't have any respect for the industry as a real mover and shaker in this area. I think what most of the cigarette companies are doing is producing products that they have to from a competitive point of view. But what they're going to do is sell their cigarettes as much for as long as they possibly can because it is the goose that lays their golden egg. Uh, there are probably some of the e-cigarette folks, uh, smaller firms, certainly the vape shops, where there are a lot of people who are very sincerely interested in helping people to quit smoking by using e-cigarettes. And I have much more respect for that group than I do for the major cigarette companies. And by the way, you mentioned this whole issue of tobacco harm reduction. What's so fascinating about the problems that we're having with getting public health to buy into tobacco harm reduction is that public health has bought into harm reduction in virtually every other field. This is the one field where they seem to be so skeptical and so negative that they're not willing to think seriously about it. Uh, examples, safe needle exchange, uh, that's one of them. Seatbelts and airbags uh, is another one. Where we, we, That was, by the way, a 20 year fight to get airbags in cars. There were airbags in cars 20 years before they were finally required, but the public health community fought for that all along. There are some school systems that distribute condoms because the just say no is a notion to both drugs and to sex doesn't work. And they understand that. Uh, we have methadone for people who are addicted to heroin. There are lots of examples of harm reduction throughout public health. They're always controversial, but public health is almost always on the side of harm reduction. In this one instance, they're not. And I think frankly, uh, a big part of that is because we've been so burned by the tobacco companies dating from 1954, uh, earlier than that actually, but from the frank statement to cigarette smokers of 1954, uh, that there's just a great deal of skepticism about anything that is related to uh, tobacco or nicotine. And of course, we should recognize there's a subset of people in public health who are opposed to nicotine per se. Why is that? They think, well, first of all, unfortunately, there are a lot of people in, in public health as well as in the general public and the medical community who believe that nicotine is the source of many of the health problems emanating from cigarette smoking. Uh, there's a marvelous, uh, depressing, but marvelous study published recently about uh, primary care physicians showing that 80% of them said that nicotine was the cause of lung cancer, heart disease, and lung disease in smokers. And when I first read this, I thought, well, maybe they were just representing nicotine as meaning cigarette smoking, but that's not what it was at all. It was very specific to nicotine. And ironically, the only one where they didn't say a large percentage uh, of the problem was nicotine associated was problems with birth for mothers who are smoking, where it is nicotine that's a source of trouble. But um, I think there are a lot of people in public health who just think the idea of addiction to any substance is anathema and they won't have anything to do with it. I've heard some of my colleagues in public health say that. If there is this push against uh, tobacco harm reduction, is it not true though in the last year that there has really been a surge in efforts? Because I've noticed that it seems to me that there is a real fight going on on behalf of tobacco harm reduction from the science side. Well, you, you may be a better judge of that than I would be, frankly. Uh, because I'm involved in producing the papers and working with my colleagues. And uh, my first paper on the idea of harm reduction was in, the, in 1997 in the Journal of American Medical Association. I and mean, we're, we're talking about many, many years ago now. 
Uh, so I've been working on this for a long time. I do think there've been some very important papers coming out, but there've been important papers on both sides. There've been papers that have come out that have suggested that there's a greater risk associated with vaping than, uh, than most of us believe there to be. Uh, so there is a lot of research going on. This is still a relatively new field. The product is evolving rapidly. We've had several generations of e-cigarettes and uh, it's, it's, it's hard to keep up with it all. But as I say, I think you would be a better judge of whether there's more of an opposition coming out of the uh, scientific community than previously than I would. Well, I can tell you that for sure we can tell that in the last year, year and a half, there has been a, a concerted or at least a determined, at least it looks that way, effort to elevate the tobacco harm reduction uh, battle. It almost feels like, though, it might be a little too late. Well, I think there may be a risk that it's too late. That's a, a good point. Uh, I find this enormously frustrating because I feel it's the first time in my career that public health is actually doing harm promotion uh, in terms of smoking. I'm uh, very much afraid that the governmental administrative apparatus, FDA, with the, the its very careful scrutiny of all the e-cigarettes, uh, the public health organizations that have been pushing so hard for bans on flavors in e-cigarettes, or in some instances, ban on the sale of e-cigarettes, higher taxes on e-cigarettes. Uh, this is all going to create a return to smoking for a significant number of adults. I hope it's not a large number. It's going to increase the number of smokers, and that in turn will increase the number of deaths and illnesses that we observe due to smoking. Uh, I just published uh, a week ago uh, an op-ed in the Washington Post uh, about a very little recognized piece of the Build Back Better bill that's come out of the House. Uh, it would impose a tax on nicotine products, unconventional nicotine products, meaning e-cigarettes and pouches. Uh, that would be roughly the equivalent of the cigarette excise tax, the federal cigarette excise tax. That will increase smoking by hitting three different groups of people. So first of all, those people who have quit smoking by means of vaping, if they're e-cigarettes, if they're still vaping and their e-cigarettes become much more expensive, a subset of them, and again, I hope it's a small number, are gonna to revert to smoking. Uh, people who are dual users, vaping and smoking, who may well be decreasing their risk by virtue of their dual use if cigarettes constitute a very small part of the dual use. Uh, many of them seeing the alternative, the e-cigarettes get comparably expensive, may drop the e-cigarettes and go back to smoking full time. And the people who are smokers who would have gravitated toward e-cigarettes and tried them may think that it's not worth it now that they're more expensive they already believe they're as harmful as, as, uh, as smoking. We've misled the public badly into believing, a majority of the public in the US believes that e-cigarettes are as dangerous as or more dangerous than cigarette smoking. We know that's not even close to the truth. And it's tragic because it keeps smokers from moving in the direction that could save their lives. Now, isn't that kind of the real frustrating part about this? Typically in public health, the challenge is, is to construct a message and get it out to the public in a manner in which that they can, you know, adopt it. But it's but the battle here isn't really about the public. They had a fairly decent impression of e-cigarettes up until just a couple of years ago. It seems that like the real you got it, your messaging battle is is on the science side or it's within the public health side. It's not even messaging the public, is it? Well, really, it's, it's ultimately messaging the public, but you're absolutely right. It's what messages the public uh, are hearing. And what you just mentioned something that I find incredibly frustrating. If we go back to the early days of e-cigarettes, when, by the way, they may have been more dangerous than some of the models are today. Uh, they may have given off more emissions than, than some of the models today. But if we go back to those early days, most people perceive that e-cigarettes were less harmful than smoking. It's gotten worse over time. Every year, year after year after year, we see more and more 
American adults believing that e-cigarettes are as dangerous or more dangerous than cigarette smoking. And I said it was over half, majority. Let me put that number in perspective. If you take the people who say, I don't know, out of the equation and simply look at those who give an answer other than I don't know, it's two thirds of the American public with the remaining great group saying it's less dangerous. That's worrisome. I mean, that's a very worrisome finding. So we did need to change the messaging, but I don't know how to get through. I mean, the, the US Senate has a significant number of senators who march to the beat of the campaign for tobacco-free kids. It doesn't matter what they say, they will support the campaign for tobacco-free kids. And uh, their message is do everything you can to get e-cigarettes out of the hands and mouths of kids. And let's not worry about those poor adults. Now, obviously they don't say that, but, <laughs> but implicit in their message is let's not worry about adults. And frankly, I think we have a social justice issue here. Uh, and it's one that is not widely recognized. We mentioned it at the end of the American Journal Public Health article. Uh, most smokers today, or let me say a disproportionate number of smokers today, come from disadvantaged groups, minorities, the LGBTQ community, people who are suffering from mental health issues, ranging from depression on to others. Uh, I think that an awful lot of people who matter in our politics, the people who essentially are engaged in politics and influence politicians, don't see that smoking is a problem anymore. They're educated, they're affluent, and most of them not only don't smoke, but they don't know smokers. Their colleagues don't smoke, there's no smoking in their workplace, and there's no smoking in the restaurants and bars that they frequent. So to them, it's kind of a non-issue, but one out of seven American adults is a smoker today and smoking is still killing more people than COVID killed in its first year. The worst pandemic, the worst pandemic in a century, and it had a terrible, tragic toll. One out of 500 Americans died, has died as a result of COVID. But if you look at the first year of COVID, Fewer people died from COVID than did for cigarette smoking. This is a huge tragedy. It's an avoidable one. And I'm very much afraid that the road we're taking now is going to make it worse. Well, and it's interesting, too, because, you know, we've seen that as a result of COVID, at least, you know, ostensibly, smoking has gone up for the first time in 20 years. Well, we, yeah, I... I, I take all the data that are coming out of the COVID era with a grain of salt, and I wanna see what happens when we're a couple of years post COVID. Certainly having people restricted to their homes could very easily increase smoking because they're not at work for eight hours a day where they can't smoke. Uh, the same kind of thing with vaping. We're seeing really encouraging data about vaping having dropped among kids significantly in the last two years. It's down to where it was before it started its really sharp increase for two years. But we don't know how much of that's because kids weren't in school with their buddies. Uh, and we're gonna have to wait and see on that one. Yeah, well, certainly the campaign for tobacco-free kids and, and everyone else has been trying to raise that flag and you know push that fire that uh, it's still as bad in a raging epidemic of youth use as it was back in 2019. But it seems that reality may actually sort that uh, argument out at some point. <laughs> reality almost certainly will sort it out. The question is when and whether it will be too late. Or who's reality? Well, that, that of course is a problem that we're experiencing in our field, just as we do in the broader society, the broader American society, where there clearly are two views of alternate universes. And uh, I've, I've never in my lifetime seen anything like this. And would like to see uh, live long enough to see us get out of it. There was a paper that you were uh, co-authored uh, that's coming out or it was just out. I wasn't too sure yet. I think it was a preprint or, or something. It was the adolescent e-cigarette use associated with subsequent smoking, a new look. That's the fancy way for, for us to talk about gateway. Is smoking, or sorry, is vaping a gateway for smoking amongst teenagers? Well, it's certainly important to recognize that most people uh, in the general public and certainly most of, again, mainstream public health, 
believes that smoking is a gateway. This derives from a series of 20 or more prospective studies, most of them looking at a relatively small cohort of young people, students typically, and following them for a year. But many of them now are using PATH, which is the major data source for the US for a prospective study. And, and my colleagues and I, led by uh, Dr. Ruyan Sun and, and David Mendez and myself, uh, have just produced this paper, which has been accepted by nicotine and tobacco research. Uh, and it is now available online in its accepted form. It has not been officially published yet, but you can read it if you wish to. Um, what we did is we said, let's do the same thing that all these prospective studies have done. And I want to emphasize something. The prospective studies themselves, to their author's credit, do not say this is evidence of a gateway. That's other people. That's activists and others who want to use it as evidence that it's a gateway. I think probably, frankly, most of those authors believe that, but they're smart enough not to say that. Uh, so what we did is we said, let's use the PATH data, which are now annual data. There's a wave of PATH from 2013 through, I think it's 2020 now. I'm not sure which the most recent is. But we said, let's look at each successive wave, waves one, two, three, four, 4.5 and five. These are all a year apart. 4.5 was a wave when they looked only at kids at 17 and younger, 12 to 17. Uh, all the others look at people 12 and up, including adults. So there's a year between each of these waves. And we asked the same question and used the same design that all these other studies have done, which says, Let's find kids who have vaped at the time of their first interview, but never smoked a cigarette and see and they're in the second, the time of the second interview, which is typically six to 24 months later, whether or not they have smoked a cigarette at that point. And we control for the usual demographic variables and anything else we can control for. Now, the problem is that most of these studies have not controlled for a lot of variables that obviously influence that relationship. And what all of them have found, with no exception until now, is that when you control for these variables you have handy, it turns out that there is a statistically significant increase in the probability of trying a cigarette a year later if you had vaped in the first period, okay? Every one of them has found that. Now, obviously, there's a competing theory here which says that people who vape are more likely to smoke because they have a common liability to try various drugs and the like. That one turns out to be very difficult to assess, but that's the alternative theory. So what we did is we took each of these year-to-year -year comparisons, there are five of them, and we said, in addition, let's, let's do what the other studies have done with the same variables they've included, roughly. Then let's add into that a measure of somebody's susceptibility to smoke, something that is a, a, a it's, it comes from the surveys themselves. They ask questions and you derive whether or not they're susceptible to smoking. We also said, let's find out if they've ever used other tobacco products in the period when they have vaped but not smoked. It seems to me obvious you want to know if they have used other nicotine products when they haven't smoked. Nobody, not nobody, but very few people have ever done that. And we also added in marijuana use and alcohol use in the last 12 months. Why? Because they represent the propensity to take risky verboten behaviors. When we do this, we look at two outcomes. One of them is a standard outcome of most of these studies. And that is, uh, is the relationship statistically significant for vaping in the first period and having tried even a puff on a cigarette in the second period a year later, okay? That's a standard one. So it's ever smoking in the subsequent year. When we did that and we looked across these five different pairings, in the two most recent, the relationship is no longer statistically significant. That means that there is no statistically increased risk of having tried even a puff on a cigarette in the next year for the two most recent year comparisons. In the three earlier ones, we find the same things that other people have found as well. 
namely that the odds ratio, the increased chance of having tried a cigarette is much smaller than when you don't control for these other variables, but it's still statistically significant. The other thing we did, which most papers have not looked at, is we said, what about current smoking? And I put that in air quotes because current smoking is defined as having had even one puff on a cigarette in the last 30 days. And it turns out there's so few kids who have done that, that it's hard to get really good data. PATH is probably about as good as we can get for that. And what we found is that of the five comparisons, four out of the five had no statistically significant relationship between vaping in the first period and having smoked in the past 30 days in the second period when you included all of our control variables. Uh, let me throw in an interesting anecdote here. Uh, there is one other study that actually found something like this but didn't report it. Watkins et al. published a paper using PATH data and they included most of the variables that we did. Uh, they did not include either susceptibility to smoking or marijuana use in their main analysis. They did put them into a sensitivity analysis. And what they found in the sensitivity analysis as they reported in the paper, and by the way, you can only find this if you go to their supplementary material. They don't report the data in the paper. But in the paper, they say that we included either of these two variables, the odds ratios, the statistically significant relationship, decreased in magnitude. That's all they say. But it turns out that with regard to past 30 day smoking, it became non-significant in their own supplementary table. They didn't mention that in the main paper. So this is the first paper, ours is the first paper to report some evidence that maybe the relationship between vaping in one period and smoking in a subsequent period is not a function of any kind of a gateway effect whatsoever. That there's at least some contrary evidence. I would say that you know, the first issue that we started covering uh, that was of concern, say, in 2015, when we first picked up on this issue of vaping overall, was the gateway. Then it became flavors. And, and then it became nicotine. And then it's we're, then we're kind of still around flavors. Gateway's been a lot. I mean, is it, it feels like a whack-a-mole on the issues. Do I have that wrong, or does it tend to pop up and down like this, every, you know? No, I actually think that's, I think that's quite fair. Uh, and it, it's interesting that we're not hearing much of anything about Gateway anymore. Uh, it may be because the data are showing quite the contrary. Uh, if we take a look, I mentioned earlier that the decrease in smoking among kids is the rate of decrease is at an all time high. We're at the lowest rates of smoking that we've seen in all of recorded history for kids. And uh, the rate at which it has been declining is unprecedented, specifically while vaping has become so popular. People were predicting that we were going to see an increase in cigarette smoking among kids as a result of vaping, and we're seeing the opposite. And the same thing is true of young adults, by the way. I just saw some data today on 18 to 21 year olds and uh, 20, I think it's 22 to 25 year olds. No, 18 to 20 and 21 to 25 year olds. And in both cases, there is a sharp decline, a much sharper decline in smoking beginning around 2015 uh, than we had seen in all the previous years. And we've seen a decline for a good 25 years or more. So uh, the fact is that smoking is just not something that kids or young adults do anymore. Uh, and one question is, does this mean that there's a displacement, if you will, with vaping displacing smoking? Uh, we have some evidence certainly about snus in Sweden and to some extent in Norway uh, that snus displaced cigarettes for males. So that we see Swedish males having the lowest smoking rate of males in any European country and maybe frankly any major country in the world, but they don't have the lowest tobacco use rates. Their tobacco use rates are comparable to those of other European Union nations, but they're off the charts low 
on tobacco-related diseases, both specific diseases like lung cancer and overall tobacco-related disease. They are the lowest nation in every one of those categories. Swedish women, who until recently were not using snus pretty much at all and had relatively normal smoking rates, have pretty normal levels of tobacco-related disease by European Union standards. Some of them actually are pretty high. So that's a case where a lower risk product has displaced a higher risk product. Uh, and there's some evidence that it's, it's certainly possible that that's going on now. So I say we don't hear as much about the gateway because frankly, it's a tougher argument to make. You know, if, if the gateway were real, why wouldn't we see this increase? Now, what about flavors? In the U.S., of course, we see, you know, several regions, cities and stuff like that trying to do flavor bans. But, the re you know, the big concern in North America right now is what's going on in Canada. Because Health Canada is about if they drop the last part of the flavor ban here, that'll, I mean, that'll be it. You know, I mean, it'll basically forever unwind the legalization that the federal government here did and, and pretty much push vaping straight back into the black market because I'm not certain that people are going to just give up flavors. And I'm not too certain that, that the government and the regulator is going to be able to keep flavors out of the mix. Well, you've actually just said something very important. You're not certain what the impact is going to be. And I, I think that's an important qualification here. Uh, my reading of the literature is that flavors seem to increase or to help increase the rate of quitting among adults because adults like flavors. Adults like the same flavors kids do. Doesn't have to be named bubble gum. They like fruit and sweet flavors the same way that kids do. Uh, kids clearly like flavors. They often cite it in surveys as one of the most important factors in their vaping. But we don't know in either case if vaping were only available in let's say tobacco and mint menthol, whether we would see kids stop vaping completely or adults stop vaping. We don't know. My best reading of the evidence to this point is that it does prompt some vaping by kids and that it helps some adults to quit. So I think the notion of a ban on flavors is very bad public policy. What I would much rather see is serious restrictions on access to e-cigarettes. Uh, this could range from at the ideal, in some sense at the ideal, adult only retail outlets selling all tobacco products. So kids can't get a hold of any tobacco products directly. And they would be, there'd be licensing fees that would be strict enough that they could afford to pay people to enforce the, the rules. And there would be severe penalties if they sold to underage people. That way adults at least would have access to flavors if they wanted them. It could be, you know, that's not going to happen because the convenience stores and the grocery stores would lose too much money. So politically, it's probably not palatable. But you could at least have uh, rules and regulations that place all e-cigarettes and all tobacco products behind the counter, out of view, with no advertising or mention of them anywhere in a store, and very serious enforcement of age restrictions for sales. Um, and by the way, T21, Tobacco 21 in the United States, I think is already proven to be helpful to reduce uh, tobacco use by kids. And that's a new phenomenon across the country. Uh, I think it's a very helpful one, and um, I think it may help to account for the reductions we're seeing in both tobacco use and e-cigarette use. Let me take advantage of, of your uh, 45 years uh, in tobacco control. So there's an interesting little tiny snippet here, and that's that when discussing about flavors and the concept of, you know, okay, they may or may not uh, yet be proven to help adults quit smoking, to help adults transition uh, to a vaping product, though flavors do seem to be important, and, and adults like flavors too. But the question is this, is that what about all those, and I'd say there's a lot of adult vapors that are former smokers, It's they haven't smoked in three years, haven't smoked in five years, thanks to vaping, and they want their flavors not to quit smoking, but to continue vaping. And what's happening now is that they're getting told, you can't have that, and you're going to be using a flavor that can't even be allowed legally to be sweet. Uh, and so, I mean, essentially, you know, if it doesn't 
tastes like crap, then we're not going to, you know, we're not going to allow it. <laughs> so what about those people that are, that are long past quitting smoking and, and they're vapors and they plan on continue to vape it? I worry about them. I worry about them for the reasons you've given. Uh, frankly, I would encourage all people who are vapors to stop vaping as well if they're capable of doing it. If they're not, vaping is far superior to smoking cigarettes. We know that in the UK, at this point, of those people who quit smoking by vaping, a majority of them have quit vaping as well. So that's a very possible thing to do. In the US, uh, we're not quite there yet, but the data have been moving in that direction. So, I mean, the first and foremost thing I would say is, you know, if you're capable of quitting vaping, you know, go to nicotine gum or patch or something. If you, That's going to have fewer risks associated with it than vaping. Uh, but I am very definitely concerned about people who've managed to quit smoking who would not have done so otherwise without e-cigarettes. Uh, I want them to be able to continue vaping, and that for many of them may mean that they need or really want the flavors and i think they ought to have them for that reason hmm. i think the question and that's a great answer and thank you very much dr warner for that and let me just add this and get your response is that it just seems that like is there any room in public health's mind for a potential recreational nicotine market that exists with say some variety of different delivery systems that are much safer than smoking and, and allow them to be enjoyable? Or, or is that not really a practical future? Well, let, let's distinguish two groups. One is public health and one is the public. Mm. Uh, public health tends to have a very prudish quality to it. And uh, that sort of means that I think there's probably not a lot of room for recreational nicotine in the public health community. For the public, maybe one day, but the understanding of nicotine at this point is so bad, uh, it is so poorly understood that I think we're a long way from that day. If people started thinking of nicotine as being something not too dissimilar to caffeine, and I'm not saying they're the same, but they have very similar short-term effects on blood pressure and pulse, and there's no evidence that caffeine use is dangerous to health for people who are heavy coffee drinkers. Uh, if we could start thinking of nicotine as falling into that category, then maybe the public would be much more receptive to recreational nicotine. Uh, there's certainly a subset of the public who's already receptive to that. Uh, but I also think that they're largely a pretty educated part of the public that understand that it's not the nicotine that's killing them, it's the other stuff in cigarette smoke that's killing them. Uh, but I think we're probably a long way from finding a widespread accept acceptance of the idea of recreational nicotine. I have a couple of final questions uh, wrapped around 2022. Let's first of all, with FDA and PMTA and the denial in the millions uh, you know, of these applications, and having obviously some familiarity with the with the process, where are we at with that? I mean, is, is this it? Like, is there any way of winding back or are we already in a position where there's only going to be a couple and that's it and, and it's, it'll get sorted out here, you know, sometime soon? I think and I hope that there will be more than a couple. I am very disappointed that a tobacco company product is the one that has been approved at this point but it's reflective of the very bad design that FDA has used for the PMTA. I understand the pressures, both legal, what's in the law that authorized them, uh, and political, uh, but they have made this PMTA process almost impossible to get through. Uh, it is so expensive. It requires so much talent, so much human talent. It requires so much legal resource to complete this thing. You're gonna spend millions of dollars to file one of these that has a chance of getting through. And they're only, the only ones that can do that are the major companies, and that's primarily the major cigarette companies. Uh, FDA has spoken eloquently on the need for recognizing the nicotine continuum of risk. In 2017, they talked about a comprehensive plan that was going to essentially push the level of nicotine down in combustible tobacco products to levels incapable of sustaining addiction and 
providing alternative reduced risk products for people who were so addicted to the nicotine in their cigarettes that they just couldn't give them up. But give them some viable alternatives. We've got the viable alternative right now. Getting nicotine out of cigarettes, getting it down to a non-addictive level is going to be a, a huge political chore. So what I would have liked to have seen is for them to come up with some product standards that define what constitutes a reasonably low risk e-cigarette. And if you as a manufacturer can demonstrate that you're meeting those standards, those product standards, you would be printed to sell that product. They're not doing anything to cigarettes at all, the most dangerous product of all. So if they take this nicotine continuum of risk that they talked about so eloquently, they're ignoring the really dangerous end of it. And in fact, they're encouraging the dangerous end of it by not encouraging or passing, like approving PMTAs for the e-cigarettes and other products that are so much lower in risk. This process is going to play out over years because we know there have already been, I think it's 30 lawsuits filed or something against the PMTA decisions by FDA. Those are certainly going to be around for a long time to come. Um, FDA still has a large number of PMTAs. They have not announced what they're going to do with them. Uh, I'm watching, I think we're all watching what they do with Juul in particular. Um, Juul, to their discredit, uh, did not handle the issue of kids and vaping well at all in the early period. I think when they recognized this, they responded appropriately. Um, I understand from one colleague who's much more knowledgeable about health effects than I am, that Juul is actually one of the cleaner of the e-cigarettes. It produces some of the least uh, emissions in the aerosol that you might be concerned with. Now, all e-cigarettes have something like two orders of magnitude fewer chemicals than cigarette smoke. So all of them are going to be significantly less risky than smoking, but they do contain some chemicals of concern. And apparently Juul has less of those than many of the other products. I don't want this to be an ad for Juul, that, but we're all gonna be watching what happens to Juul since it's been so much a part of the story over the last several years. The irony is, is that they could get approved and, and there could be just a small handful with Juul being one of them, uh, and, and then people are going to shake, cause I know the campaign for tobacco free kids has been shaking their head a bit over what FDA has done so far. Of course they have. I mean, nobody's happy. Neither side is going to be happy. I mean, campaign for tobacco free kids and everybody on the, on their side of the, did not want to see anything approved. And already they've seen a RJR product approved. I mean, that, you know, that's horrible to even contemplate if you're in, in their particular uh, neck of the woods. On the other side of it, the vaping community is certainly very unhappy about what has happened to this point. And uh, we all would love to know where this is going to end up, but we're not going to know very soon, I don't think. We may know FDA's decisions relatively soon, meaning within the next year or so, probably will know them. But that doesn't mean that's where it's going to end up because there are always lawsuits with anything that FDA tries to do. If you if you make neither party happy, neither side happy, right? Then maybe that's the actual the right way to go. Maybe that's the right decision. They, you know, split the baby, so to speak. Yeah, well, I, I think that's probably right. But the question is whether you're cutting off the baby at the neck or you know some toes. And uh, my concern right now is with where we stand with the PMTA is they're cutting the baby off at the neck. There's not going to be much of the baby left for the e-cigarette market. And, uh, you know, this anything that damages this e-cigarette market helps the cigarette market. That's what's so tragic about it. And it, the fact that Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and other organizations that work with it don't understand that. I'm sure if they truly understood it, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. But it's shocking to me that they don't understand it. I'm working with some colleagues on a paper trying to come up with a series of policy proposals that would hopefully address the major issues without doing a lot of damage to either side. Uh, because most of the policy proposals to date 
are to get rid of e-cigarettes in one form or another, whether it's tax or laws banning them. Uh, and those obviously have the harms we've been talking about here. Uh, so there's got to be a better package of proposals, and we're working on that. And by the way, uh, two colleagues and I have just had another paper, same two colleagues, actually, another paper, ex oh, no, it's two different, uh, accepted that looking at the rate of smoking cessation since 1992 in six-year intervals to the present time, actually to 2019 or 2020, I think it was in one case, um, and we did a paper like this that was published several years ago, 2017, we've updated it. The most recent six years, we're seeing an increase in smoking cessation in the U.S. in excess of what would have been predicted based on the trend that we have observed since 1992. Now, what accounts for that? We don't know. We haven't seen any more taxes than we used to see. We're not seeing any more policies about banning smoking indoor in public places, but we do have vaping during that time. And that may have contributed to this increase, but it's the only thing that we can think of that is really different.